Welcome back to AFTV, everyone. There's a massive smile on my face. Not only because Graham is back, but because Arsenal went to Newcastle and I was going to say did the unthinkable. I don't think it's unthinkable that Arsenal win at St James's Park. Actually, before last year, we had a really good record there. But I think this was the first time Arsenal went to a really big away ground against a side who are in real form, who have plenty to play for. Job done. Win, clean sheet, three points. And reminding everyone what a great side we've been. Like, like the rest of the season didn't happen. <laughs> we had to remind everyone we're actually a very good team, Graham. Yes, uh, I, I think the thing was, James, I think everybody sort of like thought that this week would be the week where the title would be decided. Mm. But it's yielded Arsenal six points with two wins over Chelsea and Newcastle. And as you say, there was, a, there was an argument for this being, I think, Arsenal's best performance of the season. I saw that James Manicolas, uh, Gunner Blog, actually mm. tweeted that last night and just showed how far the team has come with their two wins against Tottenham and Newcastle away from home this year, which were mm. very good performances. Because if you remember last year, we went to places like uh, Newcastle and Tottenham when Champions League was on the line and we folded, capitulated and lost both games. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, we learned our lesson from last year to match them with their physicality, their intensity. Um, but I think to beat them, we had to sort of like be brave mm -hmm. and play around their press, mm -hmm. uh, which I think we did really well yesterday with our technical ability, which we're going to talk about uh, in, in the show today. Uh, and in the end, I thought it was a, a fantastic performance uh, and a great win. Yeah, it was a fantastic win. And there's so, there is so much. Trouble. You wouldn't believe the amount of content we've not included in today's show just to try and include everything else. And it's not because certain things are more important than the other things. It's because maybe other things have happened in other games. So we've had a chance to mention them elsewhere. But look, Arsenal had seven shots out of 11 on target to Newcastle's five out of 12. We had less possession. We completed less passes. We even had a lower XG. But I don't feel like these numbers really tell the full story, Graham. I think it was a great game between two really good mm. teams developing under two really bright uh, young coaches. Uh, I, I think the thing is, I think the, the, the start of the game, Newcastle in that first 15 minutes were absolutely exceptional. Mm. Uh, they could have been ahead. They had the chance when Murphy hit the post early mm. on, their first real attacking movement. And then came the first big moment in the game where uh, they had a penalty given, overturned by VAR, mm -hmm. correctly overturned by VAR in my decision mm -hmm. uh, for handball uh, against uh, Kivior, mm -hmm. which it clearly showed on VAR that it touched his thigh before going onto his hand. I'm not even sure it touched his hand. Um, I'm, not, I'm not convinced. Well, whatever. He, yeah. had his, he, had his, yeah. he had his arms behind yeah. his back, didn't he? So you mm -hmm. could argue about that. Uh, and I think the team were really struggling mm -hmm. uh, uh, at that time in the game. But unlike the Man City game where we started really uh, in a very similar vein against Man City when we were getting overrun, I think what we did really well, and Arteta really learnt in this game. He learnt with his in-game management. Mm -hmm. First thing he did, which I noticed straight away, was we were getting overpowered in midfield by their press. And we're going to talk about the adjustment that he did in the game today uh, that, that I think benefited the team, is he moved Granite Jacker back into the double pivot, back mm -hmm. alongside Jorginho. Jorginho, who was the big selection call for this game, because Thomas Partey, with his physicality, you thought would have been ideal for this game. He wanted the control and the composer of Jorginho. Jorginho came into the team and obviously had a very fine performance. But he had to be helped, I thought, by Granite Jacker, who I thought was absolutely exceptional. We're going to talk about Granite Jacker in this programme today. One goal-saving tackle, I thought, in the second mm -hmm. half when Newcastle nearly scored. But he moved back into that double pivot alongside Jorginho to give us control mm -hmm. and the technical ability then to, to, to play around Newcastle. I thought Newcastle were guilty in the fact what we did at Manchester City with Joe Linton and, and Willock almost like pressing on to Jorginho and Jacka really in a frenzy type way mm -hmm. that sort of enabled Odegaard to get free between the lines. And those two players had the technical ability. I know you've done a brilliant piece today on that 14 pass movement that we're going to talk about that led to the chance for Martinelli. But we started to play round them. Mm -hmm. And then in that moment from the VAR reversal, I thought Arsenal got into the game, James. Yeah. And for that uh, 30 minutes, uh, we controlled the game and had three Massive chances, big yeah, chances did. to actually go further ahead at half and time. And I want to touch on those big chances. because This makes it seem a very even game. And I think it was an even game. I think you, you said yourself off camera, if you play that game 10 times, maybe Newcastle win some of them. And I, and I, I agree with that. Mm. What I would say about the Arsenal, I, I think chances and the word chances are just thrown out there. Newcastle had this many chances, Arsenal had this many chances. And Robbie's always very good at this. Robbie always says, well, hold on. What did we do to prevent the chances 
that you know the other team created. And when I look at some of those Newcastle chances that they they missed, or some would think they should have scored from, I think the Fabian Share one, great save from Ramsdale. But I think that's kind of the only one where I think it's a great save, but he really should have buried that. You pick a corner, or, or I mean, he did really well, Ramsdale, don't get me wrong. But I look at a lot of the others, the Joe Willock one, not even the Xhaka block, but let's talk about the Joe Willock one earlier in the first half. You know, I think actually the defenders have closed the gap. He has to take the shot early, and therefore it's nearer to Ramsdale. So I think that's actually quite good defending. I think the, um, the, the Xhaka block, yeah, Willock, you know, he's going to score. But Xhaka gets back and deals with that. The two where they hit the post, I think they've done well to hit the post. I don't think those are bad finishes. I think, you know, the angles aren't great, but they make something of that chance and they hit the post. Whereas with the Arsenal chances, I think Newcastle got luckier we didn't take them. Saka does really well to get through on goal, but it's a poor effort straight up hope. I think the Martinelli one, he can do better. Erdegaard has to score. Mm. You know, it's not that a great block. He's just, he's just not put it either side of Pope, like I said with the share one. So while I think, you know, the XG will ultimately tally up to something quite even, I think you can credit Arsenal for having defended really well, getting bodies on the line and, and narrowing angles and doing what they can to stop Newcastle. Whereas I think Arsenal should have actually taken some of their chances and probably been 2-3, let's call it 3-1 up at half-time. Yeah, and, and I thought, uh, watching it with my son yesterday, I said to him at half-time, we're probably going to pay a penalty here. We should be more than one ahead. Yeah. Uh, because I think that after the... Uh, we created two big chances and seven shots at goal mm. after the VAR reversal up to half time. So, uh, you know, we had great chances, I think, to be further ahead in that game. Mm. We won it, I think, ultimately because we were the more clinical team. Now, mm. Let's not be, you know, you know, let's not be around no, the No, no, Newcastle were good. Newcastle, Newcastle were good. We yeah, were yeah. slightly more clinical to win the game, but it was a very... It was a, I really enjoyed that game of football yesterday. Yeah. It was a great game for the new Throwback, yeah, yeah, I completely agree. We'll just fly through these quickly. I mean, 42 final third entries for Newcastle to our 33, 48 deep touches to 30, 17 zone 14 touches to our 7, and a field tilt of 58% to our 42%. And we'll just have a look at some of the defensive stats because what you picked out here is how interesting the fact that the passes per defensive action is really low for both. It, it, both it, wanted to engage exactly. with each other. Exactly. It was, it was unlike that. You know, I didn't do the Chelsea game with you, but I've never yeah. seen a team like Chelsea... Yeah. sit off us so much as they did that night. It just didn't even press us. Yeah. But Newcastle and Arsenal, you had to be good in this game when you got the ball because mm -hmm. uh, we're going to do a section on, on duels and the way football is changing now later in the show. But this just showed you, you, know, you ha ha how good we were, I think, because look at the passes per defensive action. That's the amount of passes you allow before you engage. Mm -hmm. uh, they're really low numbers. So whenever yeah. an Arsenal player or a Newcastle player got the ball, Immediately, he was being pressed, mm -hmm. and that went on throughout the game. It was a high, intense game, James. A yeah, really was. good game to watch between two good footballing teams. Newcastle played their part. Who deserve to be where uh, they, they are? They, they are the they, second they, and they third are, best They team are in the a really good developing team under Eddie Howe. Uh, and and to, uh, another point I want to make today is that I think Liverpool are the only team who've gone up there and won in, yeah. in 26 Premier League home well, games. They played under Howe. They beat them twice. So that shows how good they are to James's part. Mm -hmm. Arsenal had to get the result yesterday, James, and mm -hmm. that was the other thing about it. We couldn't settle for a point. We had to be really good. And these numbers, I think, show that defensively that we were clearing our lines really well, mm -hmm. uh, tackling really well as well. Uh, Bukayo Saka and Gabriel Martinelli had their highest ever tackle, successful tackle mm. in a game in an Arsenal shirt. That just shows how hard they worked off the ball. Yeah, I completely agree. I will say, I did just say that this is the second and third best team in the league and it showed with what a great contest it was. I also think Arsenal did flex their muscles a bit though and show why they are in the race with the top two, with Man City and up there and further away from Newcastle because I think we showed so much quality. Now you wanted to talk about, this is the 11 that went out. But it didn't quite look like this, especially after the VAR decision. In fact, actually, let me just bring up that stat, the VAR check, because this was a big moment. That In the period after the VAR reversal, Arsenal had seven shots, 1.2 XG, and two big chances. And I added to that that in the 10 minutes after the decision, Newcastle actually didn't have a single shot. Arsenal, though, did score. So you wanted to talk about why that was the yeah, case? Yeah, and, and I, I think that... Um as I said earlier, I think the key really was uh, the fact that uh, Jacker was normally plays here, Odegaard mm. normally plays here, uh, right-sided and left-sided number eight, and Georgina, who come in, is really here in the, in the single pivot. Mm -hmm. They were running through this first half with their. They've got power and physicality in their midfield. 
uh, Willock, uh, Joe Linton and Murphy, three really top pressers. Mm -hmm. And he played Isaac and Wilson together in a two yesterday, which was interesting. But I think when we were getting overpowered in that first 10 minutes, James, what he did was Arteta, which he didn't do at Manchester, he went back to the double pivot. We came almost like a 4-2-3-1 mm. with Granit Xhaka dropping back next to Jorginho. Mm -hmm. And then Odegaard tended to float more across yeah. the front here, trying to get between the lines. Mm. Saka was marking, uh, uh, Martelli were working back as well. Yeah. And full credit to Gabriel Jesus, because I looked at the teams when I came on the pitch yesterday. Newcastle had eight players, uh, which were six foot, six mm. footers. And our team looked quite small compared to theirs. But what we didn't have at St. James's Park last year when we went down 2-0 there was someone who could hold the ball up uh, and engage in the physical battles like Gabriel Jesus did. He, he was immense it. yesterday. He gave their six-foot defenders a real hard time. Mm -hmm. But I thought it, this was the key for us to get stability in front of our back four. Mm -hmm. Jacka dropping back in here alongside Georgina in a double pivot. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. And you wanted to talk about the pass network. Let's get it up here. Um, because it, it spoke about how important Georgina was, but also actually where Jacka was for most of the game yeah. to help out too. When I watched that game yesterday and saw what was happening, I wanted something to prove it. And I found this uh, on Canon Stats. The passing network shows clearly Jacker and Jorginho closer together mm -hmm. in that double pivot for most of the game in the passing network. Yeah. When Arsenal uh, uh, played out from the back. Yeah, and, and I, wanted to, I wanted to talk about um, Mikel Arteta and this quote I found very, very interesting. Because you talk about... Newcastle, they have loads of those players were over six foot. We know the power. They, they play, they remind me of Liverpool in the last sort of five, six years under Klopp. They're very, the 4 3 3, very physical midfielders. They kind of overwhelm you. Now, this is what Arteta said on Sky about Jorginho. He said, I think he was the man of the match. I agree, Mikel. Uh, there, was a quest, there were question marks because it was going to be really physical. But if you want to go physicality versus physicality, we have no chance to win the game. So we had to try for something different. What he's essentially said there is, well, we could have played Partey. Actually, maybe Rob Holding. We, we, you know, we did a lot of deep block defending. Maybe they'd be suited for that kind of game. But he went, if we're going to win this game, there's no point trying to level ourselves up to be a better version of what they do well so that we can go head to head with it. And let's just do what we do, but better. And I think the bringing in of Jorginho and Kivio was massive. Now, very unprofessional of me. I'm going to look at my notes because I want to make sure I get this all in the right order. But let's talk about Jorginho and his stats. This is why he was so impressive. An 83% pass accuracy, 70 touches, 10 final third entries, 9 ball recovery, 7 ground duels won, 2 key passes and 3 tackles won as well. He played all 90 minutes. So as well as he did his attacking, you know, he's on, in, on the ball, all that. He was very good defensively as well, Graham. Yeah, so very positionally assured. I, I think what he offers the team is uh, you talked about the control, the composure. Uh, I think he's somebody who's really comfortable when he's pressed. Mm -hmm. So when we're sort of like uh, dropping into a, a, a deep block or we're trying to play out and he, he gets uh, to receive the ball off a, a centre half or he's going to receive the ball short, mm. when he's pressed, he's somebody who's very press resistant yeah. uh, and, and he's somebody who can sort of take the ball comfortably and he always makes the right pass. You're going to make a great uh, comparison today between Party and Holding and him and Kivor. Mm. They were always looking to sort of like get on the ball, control the tempo, but play forward. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've lacked over the last few weeks. Yeah. He offered the team real stability yesterday. Yeah. And I, I admit, I was a bit like you. I thought Party would play for the physicality. Mm -hmm. yeah, I still yeah. think we had to win our duels, though. And we mm -hmm. did win our duels all over the pitch in this game. Possibly apart from Zinchenko was having some trouble with Murphy, which is why he was hooked at the start of the second half. Mm -hmm. But also... Not only were we sort of brave on the ball and technically good with Jorginho controlling the tempo, I thought we matched them in the duels. And although Arteta talked about we couldn't match them in the physicality, I thought we did that. I thought we won most of our duels all across the pitch. I so. completely agree. Gary Neville compared him to Paul Scholes and that kind of very rare wow. player that's able to yeah. control a game via yeah. their calm and composure. I learned something about Jorginho yesterday, everyone. I learned that. I've heard Kukurea say it, you know, uh, the day we signed Jorginho. I've, said other I've heard other players over the years say that Jorginho is one of the most technically gifted players they've ever played with, if not the most technically gifted or the most intelligent. And I'll be honest, I kind of, I I've always appreciated how good he was on the ball. But I've always thought on a, on a dead ball or, or, or a passing technique or whatever, yeah, he's very good. But there's others who are very, very good. I wonder what makes him the best. And this is what I learned yesterday. It's not his ability to execute it, his ability to do it under pressure yes. in really tight situations Understood. and maintain the composure but to do he's it. He's also a playmaker at number six. That's yeah. the thing that people don't appreciate. 
There is probably, if you look at a weakness to his game, I know a lot of Chelsea fans will say probably pace is not his strongest asset. Yeah, yeah. But he more than makes up with that in, in the way he reads the game and it's he positions himself. And he was excellent yesterday. His reading the game is unbelievable. And I wanted to talk about this, the Kivion Jorginho impact. Now, what we've got here is their touches and passes in the Chelsea-Newcastle game that Kivion Jorginho started. And... Uh, West Ham and Southampton for holding and party. I thought it'd be unfair to include Man City because we were just so outclassed. But other, you know, other games I think are slightly more comparable. Now I think there's not too much to take from this other than, f firstly, Georgina Kivio saw far less of the ball. I wonder what that tells you. Maybe because Chelsea and Newcastle are better players, so there's slightly more respect for those oppositions. I don't know. Um, but I think the big thing is the fact that Georgina clearly 28 more passes than Kivio. 25 or 24 more touches than Kivior. In this game, there's not as much in it in terms of passes. Well, passes, there's four more passes for Partey and touches far more for, well, not, not far more, but more. But the numbers are a lot closer. I think it makes sense to me that you want Jorginho to have a lot more of the ball than your centre-back, Kivior. You want your six to have it a lot more than your centre-back, especially when a Rob Holding isn't as good on the ball. And what we saw with this chance here where is it, Martinelli chance? We saw how the team just benefited off their composure and what Arteta was saying about there's no point going physicality for physicality. We're going to play our football, we're going to outpass them. And this move is such a shame it didn't result in a goal because it is everything Arsenal have done brilliantly this season. Here's the team. Now, not everyone's perfectly in their position, but from the defenders, yes. Now, Ramsdale's got the free kick that's won by Jorginho. He gives it to Kivior, straight to Ramsdale. Ramsdale takes a touch, back to Gabriel. Now they're pressing. Isaac's come all the way across. They think they've got us in a really good position here in Newcastle. But Arsenal are so calm. Xhaka and Jorginho, rather than just sprinting over to try to give an option, or Gabriel thinking, oh no, I'm swarm. Let me just go along to Martinelli where the space is behind. He goes, okay, fine. We'll give it into Zinchenko. Zinchenko's going to just take a little touch. Xhaka, recognising there's no pass on, decides to move out. Martinelli's going to come in. And Jorginho reads that there's an option for him to receive it. Gives it back to Gabriel, and everyone's moved around, but we're back in the same position. What's happened here, though, is that because of the movement and the composure, the pieces are getting pulled apart. Isaac's dropped in to cover because it didn't quite work for him, so Willock's having to come into the front three to press. Joe Linton's gone all the way to Zinchenko, so there's a little bit more open space in this area of the pitch, and Gabriel just threads it into Granite Xhaka, and at that point, we're out. The Arsenal players know we are out. They get it. It's a bit of a heavy touch from Xhaka, but he does well because it was a heavy pass. Gives it to Erdegaard. I mean, I wish I could do justice to this little touch and roll into Ben White from Erdegaard. But Arsenal playing out. Now, I think Ben White actually gets it wrong here. I think he should release Saka earlier. In fairness, Saka is further up the pitch. But he carries us forward. Takes a touch and comes back. Erdegaard rolls it into Kivior. And now this bit's massive. And this is where your composure on the ball. We showed it with Jorginho back into Gabriel. And we see it now with Kivior. That is a very easy pass to Gabriel. He's in loads of space. Murphy's dropped all the way back in to cover. Jesus has pulled wide. He could easily just give it to Gabriel. He can open up and we've got them in a position we sustain a little bit of possession. But because he's so composed, he just drills it into Zinchenko. Erdegaard, who had played the pass to Kivior, recognises he can drive in. We've got that overload, that box. And then it just goes into Erdegaard, who then threads it into Martinelli. And I think Martinelli should do better. But... That whole move, I think, showed you everything Arteta meant in terms of we're going to just play our football and play around them, everything you said as well. Um, but it also shows you what Jorginho and Kivio brought us in terms of composure. Yes, they stood up to the physical battle by being there and reading the game well and using the physicality they have to a degree. But really, it's the way Newcastle just, I think they lost faith in their press because Arsenal just played around it so brilliantly. Yeah, the move definitely deserved the goal, didn't it? It was yeah. a fantastic move. Uh... Uh, passing movement, which I think you brilliantly recreated there. Really enjoyed watching it again, even yeah. on, on the tactical bag. As much, as, it, it, even as, much it, yeah. as I enjoyed watching it yesterday. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, Gabriel Martinelli couldn't put it away, deserved the goal. But everything you've talked about with Kivior and uh, um, uh, Jorginho mm. in, in build up was exemplified in that movement. I thought the whole team, you know, once we sort of like got through that first 15 minutes, we quietened the crowd, and Newcastle hadn't sort of like struck early. I thought as we started to look technically better on the ball, I thought they lost a little bit of heart and they mm -hmm. sat off us a little bit. Um, uh, when they pressed, I didn't think they pressed as, as wholeheartedly as they did at the start. 
and we started to sort of our greater technical ability shone through and I thought that was the difference between the two teams yesterday mm -hmm. I think we was slightly had the better technical ability and mm -hmm. we were brave and this move exempl exemplified the bravery James yeah I completely agree and I think some of these numbers just tell you yeah so much about modern football because let's make no mistake about this, okay? Arsenal mm. weren't on top, as we showed in some of the numbers, they weren't on top the full game. Newcastle threw a lot at us. Yet, the pass completion numbers are in favour of the defenders. Zinchenko came off with 90% pass completion. Gabriel, 87. Kivior, 86. We talk about Newcastle pressing, trying to make it difficult for us. But they show composure at the heart of the chaos. They were still receiving the ball. They were still having to mix up between going long and going short. But they had Newcastle coming at them with a really loud St. James's Park. But the picture of composure, white in there, Jorginho too. And then the most jewels came from your front three. And yeah. then your midfield three, which again shows that Arsenal wanted to engage up the pitch. It wasn't just the defenders and the last line of defence having to do the engaging with Newcastle. We challenged them all over the pitch. So for all Arsenal had to dig in and show a different side, so much of it was about Arsenal's principles that they've shown all season. Fantastic, yeah. Great pass completion numbers there for those uh, six players. And we talk about the way modern football is now. About, about, but it's all about winning your duels, about yeah. physicality across the pitch. So, as much as Arteta is correct, you want that composure and technical ability on the ball, you also have to win your duels. And I think this was shown in these numbers. Gabriel Jesus offered us a, a physical outlet that we didn't yeah. have up there last season. He was sort of like, he's nowhere near the height of their centre-halves centre, centre -halves and Dan Byrne, but he, he was more than a match for them. Saka and Martinelli, who, were, as I said earlier, won most tackles they've ever won in an Arsenal shirt each, I think five and four respectively. Even Jorginho was good in the duels. Yeah. Uh, and Martin Odegaard, how brilliant was he yesterday? We're going to talk about what he offers to the team away from home. I think he's now scored uh, 15 Premier League goals, the most for an Arsenal midfielder since Cesc Fabregas in 2009-10. Um, well, while you're on the numbers, he's, he, that's actually 15 non-penalty, uh, yeah, non-penalty goals uh, by a midfielder, which is equal with De Bruyne. So, sorry, it's the most non-penalty goals by a midfielder in Premier League history ever, alongside with De Bruyne. Yeah, and away from home now, I think he's got something like 12 uh, goal contributions, uh, nine goals and three assists. He's a difference maker away from home for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and his goal yesterday reminded me a bit of the goal he scored at Tottenham from yeah. distance, uh, a fantastic left foot strike. I think the only two players ahead of him on goal contributions away from home are Kane and Haaland, wow. who scored 13 goals, no assists. He's, he's third on 12, and then I think you've got Ivan Tony. Uh, sorry, he's third on uh, 12, yeah, and Tony's fourth on 11. He's the difference maker for me, Martin Odegaard, yesterday. Mm -hmm. he, that was an exceptional performance. The control we got in the game, I thought, was from Jorginho at the back, alongside Jacket, and then Odegaard between the lines. And I, yeah. and I think... Just a shame he couldn't put away that chance he had yeah, at half time. But I yeah, know. that just that's a great se segment you've got there on modern football. Very true. Now let's talk about Granit Xhaka's numbers. We have still so much to talk about. We talked about Erdegaard. And by the way, Erdegaard deserves infinitely more praise than yeah. we're going to give the time to yeah. on this show. So get in the comments. There's just one thing I want to say is that he scored uh, more non-penalty non-penalty box goals in a season more than Frank Lampard ever did. So he's got, like, did we say, was it 13? In a single season. In a single season. Lampard, yeah, Lampard who was, 13, he's, yeah. is seen as the, uh, the greatest ever sort of like goal scorer from midfield, isn't he? Mm. Non-penalty box goals. Uh, Odegaard is now ahead of him this season. That's how brilliant he's been. But Granite Jacker, yeah. let me just go on to him, James. Do it, take and, it and away. You, you can do the numbers. But this, to me, was a, a fantastic performance. That mm. tackle that he made mm. was a goal-saving tackle. That was as good as a goal. And he was, I loved the thing that I loved about him yesterday was that he, was, he loved the, the physical battle as well as he offers us that control. He went down four times in that game yesterday. We managed that game so well, didn't we? Uh, and Eddie Howe was going on about the way that we were taking time out of the game, forgetting what they did at the Emirates back in January. But Granite Jack was in a running battle with Joe Linton all game, wasn't he? He kept t telling Joe Linton what he thought of him. Went down four times. But look at his numbers, James. I'll let you read the numbers. 44 touches, 3 out of 3 long balls, 2 out of 3 ground duels, 1. He played the full 90 minutes, as you can see there as well. 4 clearances, 2 tackles, 1 chance created, 1 blocked shot. And we know what shot that was he blocked. Can I, can I just say on Granite Xhaka, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I really am. I am so sorry to, to Granite Xhaka, to Mikel Arteta, because I don't think my opinions of his performances in the past... I don't, I don't take them all back. I don't think he's always been the player 
in his six, seven years at Arsenal that he's been in the last two years. Because I'll give him last season as well. I thought he was good. This season has been unbelievable. This was my favourite ever Granite Xhaka performance in an Arsenal shirt. I loved it. Better than the FA Cup final performances, which I don't think he gets enough credit for. He's brilliant in those games. Uh, better than some Tottenham, North London derby. This was my favourite. The reason it was my favourite is because it was everything I thought Granite Xhaka was when we signed him from a boxer box midfielder, making blocks in the box at one end, driving us forward at the other end, composure, being a part of our football, you know, using his left foot and, 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 and just sort of being, he wasn't so much creative in this game, but just being composed, contributed to the moves that we broke down there. But then when it got heated, the WhatsApp group was going off between other friends and they were saying, oh, Granite Jack needs to calm down. And I was saying to my dad on the phone after, and I was saying it actually live when I was with Nick on the information station, I said, I'm not worried about Xhaka here. I don't think he's going to get sent off. I don't think this is over the line. I think he's meeting fire with fire brilliantly here. And the things that maybe we've worried about Granite Xhaka in the past with, I didn't have any of those fears yesterday. I was watching him going, go on, Granite. Let them know. Let them know who you are. Let them know who we are. Stick up for your teammates and drive us through this because they're trying to get nasty here. Don't let them do it. And he didn't let them. Eddie Nketiah didn't let them. Gabriel Jesus didn't let them. Gabriel didn't let them. None of them. None of the players did. But those in particular that I've mentioned, they stood up to the fight. And it was so great to see. I feel pumped now talking about it. Yeah. He was... Who wore the armband on there? Ode Odegaard. Yeah, he, was he, 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 was, was, he was a leader on the pitch for me. And, and Odegaard yeah. was, a, was a captain's performance in yeah. his own way. But in terms of the it's getting nasty out there, he was unbelievable. And I think we always knew he had this side to him. Mm. But to, to mix that in the right way with then the football he played... He was unbelievable. And the reason I say sorry is because I always said that I didn't think we'd ever get Champions League football, let alone chance for the title with Granit Xhaka in midfield. I felt there were far too many shortcomings in his game. And was I wrong about that? I mean, yeah, I was. Obviously, I was wrong. I said that we wouldn't and, he, and we're doing it. I still think that there are elements of his game that they're not quite as polished as maybe other complete central midfielders in the league. But there's so much more than I ever gave him credit for. And I think what he's doing, and he said it in a quote that we actually referenced last week, is that he's kind of learning, he's calming down and, and whatever. But I think, I think he has evolved brilliantly. I think Mikel Arteta is getting, you know, so much out of him. And I, I, I'm so, yeah, I'm so grateful to him for his performances this season. He's been absolutely superb. Yeah, I think the, what he offers, him and Jorginho yesterday, was the, also the organisation to yeah. the team. I watched them both. Whenever like, Newcastle had a set play or... Uh, they were. Uh, uh, we defended corners really well yesterday, mm. and also uh, Trippier's got a wicked delivery, as we yeah. know from corners and free kicks. When it, I watched Jacker and uh, Jorginho, they were organising that team throughout that game. Where to be? Yeah. I want you there. I want yeah, you there. That's true. That's what experience he brings to the team with, along with Jorginho. I thought that was superb yesterday. Just one quick question for you, and I'm, I don't on. like putting you on the spot here. Yeah. But you remember when we talked about the Anfield thing, where basically you had that tackle with Trent. And they, we was sort of like, there was a question marks about whether you riled the crowd up. And obviously he was involved in the heat of it again yesterday. So what's the difference there for you between the I'm Liverpool... I'm so glad you asked this question. I'm so <laughs> glad you asked this question. Go on, then. Now, I didn't, I didn't go fully in on him on the whole Trent thing. I actually brought up the numbers on this show to show... I don't know if you saw the show yeah. I did with Turkish to yeah. show that actually our intensity dropped. Yeah. And that was a bigger problem against Liverpool than what Granite Xhaka did there. However, the Trent thing, very different. It's a calm game. We're 2-0 up. They look a bit lifeless, Liverpool. Mm. He leaves one on Trent for no reason mm. in a completely irrelevant area of the pitch. Mm. That was different. I didn't have a problem with the way that was a little bit of an afters in a tackle that wasn't important. This was Newcastle brought the fire and he stood up to it. Yeah. Very different. He didn't... There are times where you need to just outclass and calmly just deal with the opposition. There's other times where they want to make it more than a football game and you need to respond. And I think that was the difference. Grant Xhaka responded yeah. rightly against Newcastle, against Liverpool. I think he, he, he lit a flame that was unnecessary. Okay. Do you agree? Yeah, I, 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 I can see what you're saying and, and that's a great argument you make there. Um, and, and probably you're right. Um, but I, I think... I'd, I was a bit like you. On the incident at Anfield, I don't blame him for what happened in the game. Uh, but I think that he did a great interview on Sky last week after mm. the Chelsea game. You can't take that out of him because yeah. that's, him, that's what makes him the footballer he is. And yeah. I would not want him to change. Mm. He has learnt now. He hasn't been sent off this season. His, mm. his, his record is better. 
not only sort of in his contributions in terms of goals and his performances, but also in his discipline. So, oh, we talked about that last week we on did, the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah mm. I, I think I, I really enjoyed Granite's performance yesterday. Good, good, good on your Granite Jacket. Honestly, what what a season he's having. Um, let's talk about. Uh, we talked about Erdogan Jacker. Well, oh, the oh, time wasting. Of course, we yeah. don't have a stat. I'm just going to bring up the the two teams. But I thought it was hilarious that they even you know muttered the words time wasting and ball in well, play and all that i thought that was hilarious um from whoever felt the need to mention it a because arsenal were leading and so their time wasting was more we got something to protect we we, we, we we gave them a bit of their own medicine yeah uh, when they came to the emirates early in the season eddie howe uh, only 53 minutes with that ball in play in that game 56 minutes the ball was in over 56 minutes this ball was in play in this game i think uh, it was less than the one at the yeah, emirates so, i think, I think so, it was 47 and the th- minutes the thing is you know, I think that was, that's what you need to do away from home. Uh, you know, the, the way we managed the game. We talked about sort of like the uh, uh, start of the second half, they were starting to get on top. Arteta made the right subs at the right time. Mm-hmm. Took up Zinchenko, was struggling in his duel against Murphy, brought on Tierney to solidify that side. We talked about Party then came on to add a bit more control mm-hmm. to the midfield when, when we needed it. So he's, but also we managed that game really well. You know, and, and taking time out of the game now, I think... All great teams do it. Man City have, have got away with it for years. Professional fouls taking times out of game. I don't see them getting that sort of criticism. That well, Arsenal well, get. I think. Well, I think. Look, I think it, it, it's part of the game. It's the dark arts. It's brilliant. And I want to be a successful that, team. You've got to have a bit of the dark arts about him. We've always been guilty of not having that. Dream, and I want to stress, I have no problem with Newcastle coming to the Emirates and time wasting. Yeah. What I have a massive issue with is the way they did it at the yeah. Emirates. It was beyond anything I've ever seen before, the time wasting. Yeah. I've never known anything like it. The numbers show it. The yeah. numbers show you that I think that game, 47 minutes, the ball's in play. I think I think a, an average football game, something like 56 to 60 something. Yeah. You know, it was staggering. Yeah. And, and my thing is less about Newcastle and more about the referees. If you have to do the World Cup thing and add 13 minutes, add 13 minutes, do it. If they'd done it in this game, fine, because that's where it needs to happen. And what's the graphic? You sent it here. But yeah, we've got it here that basically average delay time before goal kicks, Newcastle average comfortably the most with 36.8, was it? Average delay time, so it must be seconds. Yeah, yeah. of course. Uh, but that's well above Everton, who are the second uh, mm. second highest mm. defenders with 33.1. So mm. th- there's a trend here. I mean, I think if anyone shouldn't complain it's it's eddie Howe. and i love what eddie howe's oh, done I in think newcastle he's a, yeah. i think he's a good bloke and a yeah, good manager yeah, yeah. and i really really like this team i have to say i think they're a fantastic side but but even on. they were indulging in a bit of the dark arts yesterday some of their tackling how uh bruno shares left one on jesus yeah, on purpose uh, bruno in the midfield yeah he left something like four fouls and didn't get booked there was 28 fouls in that game yeah only three cards and two of them well, for a pushing incident. Oh, the ref had a shocker the ref for did, both teams. And, he, yeah, and, and you, know, you could say that, yeah. But they were fouling us quite a lot yeah. and getting away with it. And some, mm-hmm. some really over-physical tackling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, it's one of those games, I think, that obviously he's going to take the Newcastle viewpoint. Arteta is going to defend us. Um, but w- what a game of football, James. I just want to say that I thoroughly great enjoyed contest. the game. Not just because we won the game. It was a really great game. Yeah, I completely agree. Right, let's go into the roundup stats. <laughs> And actually, while you're just getting those ready, um, I just want to make the point that we haven't even spent time talking about Arteta's subs. I think, and I mentioned that in my fan cam, I thought it was an Arteta masterclass, not just because he started with Jorginho, but because actually he brought on Kieran Tierney with 30 minutes to go early in the game, recognised Zinchenko was struggling. He took the whole of the front three off and then Erdogan recognised that they were heavily involved in the pressing and the duels and that we needed energy. I think everything the stats showed Arsenal did well, he made sure to keep re- replenishing the stock by bringing players in those areas and helping them out. So Arteta, brilliant as well. Right, closing stats for this week then, James. To put Arsenal's win at St James's Park into context, only Liverpool twice have won at St James's Park in the Magpies' last 26 Premier League wow. games at their stadium, James. There you go. Arsenal have kept eight clean sheets in their last nine games between Newcastle and the Premier League. Arsenal are now guaranteed to finish in the top two for the first time since 2015-16. Aaron Ramsdale is the first Arsenal keeper to keep 10 away clean sheets in the league since David Safehand Seaman in 1990-91. He's only the third goalkeeper to do it in the Premier League in a single season, along with two other goalkeepers for Chelsea and Man City. Who do you think those two goalkeepers are? Chelsea goalkeeper. Petr Cech. Petr Cech and Man City. Oh, no, Edison. Petr Cech in 2004-05 and 2008-09. Edison in 2018-19 and 2021-22. Each did it twice. 
Arsenal have now beaten 17 of their 19 opposing sides in the Premier League this season. Only two teams have they failed to beat this year. Southampton and Man City. Spot on. That's the best return since 2011-12, when they also beat 17. I'm surprised at that, 2011-12. But let's end with Martin Odegaard, because uh, you know, I don't think we're giving him enough praise in this show. I agree. He now has 15 Premier League goals, the most by an Arsenal midfielder since Cesc Fabregas, as I said, in 2009-10, and now has 13 goals from open play. To put that in context, one of the greatest scoring midfielders in Premier League history, Frank Lampard, never scored more than 12 from open play in a single season. Unbelievable. What a season that the team is having. And look, it might not end with a, with a Premier League title, but it might because Arsenal came through there behind Man City away. And I still think Anfield's up there because it's Anfield. I think this is in the top three biggest tests you're going to have all season. We lost Seven out of nine. Seven points out of nine. Uh, and and, and we, we lost at the Etihad, but we drew at Anfield and we won here. And I think... That is so, so impressive. And what we've done is we've asked a question of Man City. That's all we've done. They could have rested players for Everton next yeah. week. Sorry, when I said seven out of nine, I was thinking Tottenham, Newcastle and Liverpool, wasn't I? I wasn't thinking about that. Oh, uh, right. Well, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tottenham but, but, away. But, you know, yeah. we, we, had a, we had a little chat before we come on air today and we said, let's take this to the final week. Yeah. Anything's still possible, didn't we? Take That's it to the final week. That's all you've got to do, Arsenal. Take it to the final week and you never know what will happen. All right, everyone, hit the like button if you enjoyed this video. Get in the comments. Let us know your thoughts about Arteta, everything he said about how he wanted to beat Newcastle and how he pulled it off. We hope we've broken it down well enough. Let us know your feedback. Let us know your thoughts as well. Anything we might have missed. And, of course, we will be back to review who's at Brighton at home. They keep coming, don't they? All right, we'll see you very soon. Many thanks. Shop for AFTV merch at shop.aftv.co.uk Subscribe to us on YouTube Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat and Twitch We've got content for every platform So check it out <laughs>